Let's have a look at the biggest member of the new Royal Armouries Windless Eastern Sword Line. Hi folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiator, and I've had to move back away from the camera for this one because this is a whopper. This is the biggest member of the first batch of six swords that we've done with the Royal Armouries. These are certified replicas. They are as close as we can get to pure total replicas of what you will find in the Royal Armouries. And this sword that we're going to be looking at in this video is IX1787. And as you can see, this is a big sword. This is a true two-handed sword. Of the late Hundred Years War, this is suspected to be a member of the Castillon Horde, which was discovered in France near the River Dordogne in the 1970s. And this was purchased, the original of um, 1787, was purchased by the Royal Armouries in 1978. So before I get the sword out and we have a close look at the sword itself, let's have a little look at what's actually inside the box. Literally, this is the first time I've opened this, folks, so you're seeing it as fresh as me. Whoa, there we go. Right, okay, the hilt's at the other end. Let's turn it around this way so you can see better. As I said, there's proof there that I didn't know which way, <laughs> which way around it was in the box. So let's open it up there. So let's put the lid over here. Um, oh, no, I was right the first time, actually. That uh, oh no, no, I wasn't. There we go. The hilt is at the top end here. So, as we can see, it's beautifully packaged. All of these certified replicas from the Royal Armouries and Windlass, these have all been meticulously, I assure you, and painstakingly and time-consumingly measured intricately by yours truly standing right here now. Um, so I went in there, I selected these six swords for various reasons because I think they represent good examples of different types of medieval swords that people would be like to see replicated and also some of them are quite famous. This is one of those examples. This is a very well-known two-handed sword. Uh, not quite unique, it has some other parallels, a couple of other parallels in other museums. It's believed to probably be English um, and might be part of a distinctive English two-handed sword group that are somewhat like giant long swords. Inside here, I won't take it out now because I've got my hands full, as you can see, is your certificate of authenticity, um, which has got signatures on from uh, the Royal Armouries, me and Windlass, and that's your certificate of auth authenticity right there. And as you can see, it's beautifully packaged in its box, um, oil on the blade and uh, covered in plastic, so it's nice and safe from the elements. Secured in here by foam, there is a safe plastic, hard plastic end on the point, so there's no danger of that coming through the box. You have a, a leather-covered wooden scabbard with bronze fitting uh, covered in paper here. We'll see that in a second. And you can see that the hilt is fully secured. Let's just peel this away here at the top. You can see the pommel in there. And in here you also get a, a pot of windless um, uh, polish and uh, wax to preserve the sword uh, once you've got it in your home and uh, and you own it. And you can see that this thing's beautifully packaged. I'm going to go away now and open up all of this packaging, get the sword out, clean the oil off it, and let's have a look at this beauty. So here it is, this magnificent, enormous beast. Um, first up, you're going to see it looks like a massive longsword, and that's one of the things that you find about these two-handed swords of the 15th century, is they're essentially scaled up longswords. They don't necessarily diverge in design in the 15th century, that's more of a 16th century thing. So this is like, really, a giant, big longsword. As I say, found uh, supposedly with the Castillon Horde of 80-plus swords, um, probably dates to the end of the Hundred Years' War, but in typology, uh, even if we didn't have that data to go from, we'd probably say it dates to about 1450 to maybe 1480 in type. So absolutely, uh, if you're particularly interested, for example, in the Wars of the Roses or various wars that Burgundy was involved with um, in the later 1400s, this would be completely appropriate to that as well. In terms of design and typology, it's essentially a Type 18 uh, oak shot type 18 two-handed sword it's got a fishtail pommel and a straight tr cross guard with swollen terminals at the end and uh, a bit of decoration in the middle we'll look at in a bit um, 
And essentially, this is a hilt style that absolutely appears uh, and uh, becomes popular in the middle of the 15th century through to the late 15th century. So it fits anywhere really between 1450 and 1500 in terms of design. Now, in many ways, this two-handed sword was the sword that started my journey with Windlass and the Royal Armouries because I actually had some uh, very good measurements, thanks to a friend of mine, uh, Clive Thomas, of this sword which he'd published and I sent these measurements to Windlass and said look are you able to replicate this these this is a sword in the Royal Armouries and they made a very good go of it um, we then actually took that sword to the Royal Armouries or showed that sword to the Royal Armouries and they were surprised how close we'd got to the original it wasn't there yet it wasn't uh, the final version there was yet another prototype between that one and the final version here now so it's had two rounds of changes to it to get it to dial it in to get it absolutely right uh, but we've got there now and it matches the original in all ways you know length distal taper point of balance mass length of the guard um, proportions of, and detailing of the pommel everything um there are a few differences to the original. On the original, the tang is actually bent, presumably in use. Uh, so we've elected to go with the straight tang because it was obviously originally straight. It's entirely possible that the original was actually uh, damaged in fighting. If it was indeed from the Battle of Castillon or one of the other uh, conflicts uh, towards the end of the Hundred Years' War in the 1450s, it's possible that it was literally used in battle and damaged in battle. So obviously we've reinstated the straight tang and the original doesn't have the uh, grip still on it. So obviously we've reimagined the grip. However, interestingly, it's one of the rare swords that does actually have some remains of grip on it. Uh, so in fact, there are some remnants of wood and leather on that uh, original sword hilt, but not enough to tell an awful lot of information about unfortunately so we've reconstructed the grip here now as with all of these swords these are certified as i say they're certified royal armouries replicas so they have been approved by me they've been approved by henry yallop at the royal armouries they've um, been through several stages of prototyping and comparing side by side with the actual original sword so we've got incredibly close that being said, these are hand forged. These aren't CNC made. They're not made by a machine or a robot. They're not made by laser cutting or anything like that. These are hand forged in the traditional manner. Um, and so there are little variations. You'll, if you put a bunch of them together, there will be tiny variations. Um, however, they have a, a sealed pattern, essentially a model to work to, which has been approved. And all of the swords are compared to that. So it should be as close as human workers can get it to the original model. And certainly this model, which I've weighed and balanced and everything else, matches extremely closely to all of the minute uh, measurements that I took myself at the Royal Armouries. So let's have a little look at the features of this sword. First of all, let's dispense with the scabbard. This sword may never have had a scabbard, in fact, because it's so large that you can't really wear it. However, we provide scabbards with all of these swords. And so just as with the other swords in this range, uh, this has been provided with a wood lined um, leather covered stitched up the back very nicely done uh, with a bronze shape at the end. Uh, so it is a long, one of the longest scabbards you'll ever own probably uh, because of course it is for a large sword. Now here is the sword in all of its magnificence. You can see it's a type 18 blade, flattened diamond section, central mid rib, um, beautifully tapered great distal taper on it it's obviously for a sword this size pretty thick at the base of the blade and tapers all the way down to the point so for example if we flex the blade you'll notice the flex is in the second half of the blade because this is the thinner half of the blade as well as being the narrower half of the blade so despite its size this is actually quite a nimble sword for a two-handed sword bearing in mind i'm six foot one um slightly taller i guess in shoes it comes up to pretty much the middle of my pectorals okay so the middle of my chest it's a fairly it's a fairly big sword especially for this period but despite that it's really quite wieldable probably not wearable for most people this was probably carried on the shoulder or in the hand uh, in a scabbard or not in a scabbard we don't really know um, but nevertheless this is a, not a sword that you can easily wear it's not really a sidearm it's more into the category of primary weapon so it would have been used against and alongside things like pole axes and glaives and spears now as with all of these swords this blade is 1080 carbon steel 
Um, it's fully functional, hardened to um, about 52 to 54 Rockwell, um, spring tempered, so it is absolutely functional. It is a real sword. Very, very close to the original in all characteristics. Now, unlike some of the more typical long swords in this range, which in this particular period often tends towards being very stiff thrusting blades uh, that can still cut, but they've, they've given up some of their cutting capacity to become more effective thrusters for fighting in armor. This being a large two-handed sword um, can be half-sworded with and is relatively stiff. Um, however, it's quite large for half sorting, and so this is probably a weapon that's going to be used more similar to the later so-called montante or spadone, and in fact the Italians would call this a spadone, which just means big sword. The Germans might call it a Bidenhander or something like this. Commonly people these days might refer to them as a Zweihander. It's approaching those. It's not quite as big as some of the 16th century ones, but it is in that direction. And so it probably would have been used more in that fashion, quite like a giant longsword. And of course, because of its length and leverage and the length of the hilt you've got on this, the amount of force you can get into a blow is considerable. Against lightly armoured or non-armoured targets, this is going to be an absolutely devastating cleaver. But if you come up against an armoured opponent, yes indeed you could strike them with the edge, but probably more likely it would be used in half sorting, and of course you could be using the hilt elements, that big sturdy pommel, and indeed the cross guard as well. Now this blade is subtly hollow ground. It's not very heavily hollow ground, but there is a slight hollow grinding to it, which gives it really quite a nice edge geometry, quite an acute edge. It's not the broadest blade in the world, but it's not as narrow as some of the uh, other long swords of this time. So indeed sharpened well this should be a very good cutter and it has as I say nice handling characteristics. The uh, center of uh, uh, center of percussion is around where you would expect it to be about uh, three quarters of the way up the blade. Um, it doesn't have an extremely acute tip actually so I would say that sharpened well it should still cut pretty well at the tip which means you've got an absolutely immense reach with this sword. Now looking at the hilt it's got that beautiful fishtail pommel as they're commonly known. It's got a long um, hexagonal grip, I'll talk about that in a second, and a straight cross guard with two quillons with little uh, swollen ends which uh, make it slightly more user friendly for you, <laughs> uh, but potentially it also has some minimal effect of preventing things sliding off the end, not as much as hooked quillons, but nevertheless. And then it's got this very nice little detailed um, escutcheon, we could call it, in the center there, uh, which is nicely executed as you can see, and very, very close to the original. The original is somewhat corroded, but you can see that that's what it originally looked like. Um, and I should also mention as well the way that the guard is fitted to the blade. You can see that it fits in there precisely and the aperture in the guard closely matches the cross section of the blade, which as I say is flattened diamond section with very slight hollow grinding. So you've got a slightly raised midrib and slightly more acute cutting edges. The guard um, is made of European um, hardwood, uh, sourced in Germany as it happens, um, with leather covered um, with cord impression. I'll just get a little close up look at that. Hopefully you'll be able to see. There we go. Very, very nicely done. And it, just to show you how tidily done the seam is down the side there, there's no there's no real, you can see where the seam is, but there's no real lip to speak of. It's very, very nicely um, executed. And the pommel, I'm a particular fan of fishtail pommels, um, I have to say. And this is quite a detailed one. It actually took us a few goes to get this right. So not only have you got these primary grooves here and end grooves each, either side there, but you'll notice that you've then got these highlighted file, filed lines in here. And then if you look at the end, there's yet more engraved or filed lines in the end as well. So it's really quite a quite a detailed fishtail pommel and you'll notice it's also got quite detailed geometry, quite thin down here, flares this way, obviously it flares this way, but flares this way and getting the curvature of that correct. And you can see the peened end of the tang coming through at the end of the pommel there, exactly the same as on the original. As mentioned on the original of this sort, although there's some remnants of the grip surviving, the main grip doesn't survive, I elected to have this hexagonal section because it's purely sticking to the shape of the pommel. So you'll notice that the flat surfaces come down here, um, each side 
matching the grip with the pommel. It's totally smooth there, there's no lip to speak of, which means that if you're gripping with the hands wide apart in this fashion, some people might prefer to have the hands close together, but if you go all the way down and grip the pommel as someone like Filippo Vardi, the Italian fencing master, would advise, then there's no friction in the hand whatsoever. It's very, very comfortable way of gripping the sword. Um, I also personally really like the look of the hexagonal grip. I think it fits with the Gothic aesthetic of the time, and it also meets, you'll notice there, it meets the cross guard very nicely as well, and there's no overhang of the grip um, against the cross guard there. So there we go, one of the most Iconic uh, medieval swords, I would say, in the Royal Armourers collection. A beautifully proportioned sword, a beautifully handling sword, and fearsome. I mean, you would not want someone coming at you with one of these on the battlefield. Um, but it feels amazing in the hand. I have to say, it moves and tracks through the air beautifully. And um, I also think it's pretty important because it forms part of quite an important grouping, an early example of an important grouping of English two-handed swords and sits within that crucially fascinating period, particularly in English history, of the end of the Hundred Years' War and the beginning of the Wars of the Roses as well. So I absolutely adore this sword, and I'm sure that uh, any of you would be delighted to have this in your collections. And there's not many other swords around available of these proportions and of this pure, fearsome size. Thanks a lot for watching. Um, check out the links below, and I'm Matt Easton. Hopefully you'll be enjoying one of these soon. Cheers.